Hello, in this video, we're gonna talk about muscle architecture. So what is muscle architecture? We are talking about the orientation of muscle fibers relative to the muscle's axis of force generation. Okay, so relative to the axis of force generation, which is really the straight line that we could draw between its attachments. Um, so relative to that line, between the attachments, what are the orientation of the muscle fibers? Okay, so the design of a muscle determines its function and movement possibilities. Okay, so we have lots of different designs of muscle, so lots of different ways that our muscle fibers can be arranged relative uh, to the axis of force generation uh, so that we can have greater uh, muscle excursion, so like a greater distance that that muscle can stretch and contract to, um, or we can have greater force production. Um, so there are lots of different muscle designs depending on the type of contraction and what we want the effect to be when that muscle contracts. So anatomical cross-sectional area, that's the area of a cross-section of a muscle at its widest point. So in this picture, the anatomical cross-sectional area is the blue line in each picture. So in each of these, what we're seeing is the red lines that's showing the direction of the muscle fibers, and then the blue line is cutting right across at the widest part of the muscle, usually right in the center, um, and that's the anatomical cross-section of the muscle. So if we take the area of that cross-section, like if we, if we cut in that cross-section and then measured the area of the muscle of that cross-section, that's the anatomical cross-sectional area. Uh, so it's made perpendicular to the muscle's axis of force generation. So in these pictures, it's very easy to see the axis of force generation. Um, because if we just look at the tendons on either end of the muscle, we see sticking off of the top and the bottom are the tendons. That is showing us, if we draw a line straight from one tendon to the other, that is the axis of force generation. So we're saying that as the muscle contracts and shortens, that is the exact direction or the line um, of the force that it is being acted on the bone. So when the muscle's shortening, it's pulling on those tendons from either end, and those tendons are attached to the bones. Okay, so they're pulling and exerting their force on the bone at the side of their attachment. Okay, so the cross-section for anatomical cross-sectional area is made perpendicular to that axis of force generation. Larger cross-sectional area means larger and more numerous muscle fibers, which means more capacity to produce muscle force. Okay, so the bigger a muscle fiber, the more force it's able to produce. The more muscle fibers, the more force that muscle is able to produce. Okay, so more numerous and or larger fibers are going to be able to produce a greater amount of force. Okay, so anatomical cross-sectional area you know, the bigger it is, the more force we're producing. The smaller it is, the less force that muscle is able to produce. So anatomical cross-sectional area is most accurate when all fibers in the muscle travel the length of the muscle. So if you look at B in our picture here, you see that the fibers are coming down at an angle. It kind of looks like a feather. And you can see that a lot of the fibers actually aren't crossing where that blue line is cutting. So that blue line is cutting through the middle, and that's the anatomical cross-sectional area. But if we look above that, there are all these little fibers that are not being cut through. They're not being included in this anatomical cross-sectional area. Okay, so anatomical cross-sectional area is the most accurate when all of the fibers travel the length of the muscle so that they're all captured when you cut through right in the middle of the muscle, all of the fibers need to be passing through at that place where you cut it. Um, so we'll get to, we'll talk about our types of muscle architecture where that's the case. Okay, so in a muscle where all of the fibers are crossing through, the anatomical cross-sectional area would be equal to the physiological cross-sectional area, which we're gonna talk about next. Um, so the anatomical cross-sectional area is not a useful measure 
if there are a bunch of fibers that are not traveling through that center where that cut is taken. Okay, so like really in any of these, A, maybe it would be okay, but it's still not gonna be an accurate cross section because it's not at the right angle. Uh, but in B and C for sure, we're missing a lot of fibers. Um, so for B and C, it would not be appropriate to take an anatomical cross-sectional area um, because we're going to miss out on representation of a lot of the fibers that are in that muscle. Okay, physiological cross-sectional area in this picture is represented by the green lines. Um, so that's the sum of the cross-sections of all fibers in the muscle. So anatomical cross-sectional area, we're just cutting straight across in the middle of the muscle, regardless of what fibers are passing through. Uh, for physiological cross-sectional area, uh, where we're looking at function instead of anatomy, um, so we're trying to capture the function of the muscle. Um, so in that case, we're gonna take a cross-section of all of the fibers in the muscle. So depending on the design and the orientation of the fibers, that physiological cross-sectional area will look different. So like in A, it's still just one cross-section, but it's at an angle so that it's perpendicular to the direction of the fibers instead of perpendicular to the direction of the force generation. Uh, and B, same thing. Um, here, now we have pennation in two different directions. So we have angles, the fibers are coming in at an angle in two different directions. So we need to take two different cross sections. And even these cross sections, we're still not capturing those small fibers all the way at the top of the muscle. Uh, so really we would, we would have to take more cross sections, as many as we need to, to be able to capture the whole um, area of all of the fibers that are in that muscle. And then C shows a multipennate muscle where we have angulation of fibers in lots of different directions. So we need to take a lot more cross sections. So for physiological cross sectional area, we take as many cross sections as we need to and then add up all of that area and that's the total physiological cross sectional area. Um, so the point is that it shows the total area of all of the fibers in the muscle contributing to force production. Um, so just like with anatomical cross-sectional area, same rules apply. A larger area is going to mean larger and or more numerous fibers, which is going to mean a greater amount of muscle force that that muscle is able to produce. Okay, so muscle classification. Um, so we can classify all of our different muscles according to their architecture. Uh, so muscles are either longitudinal, and another word for that is parallel, or pennate, like the ones that we just saw in the picture we were just looking at. So pennate meaning like they come in at an angle. So they're either longitudinal or pennate depending on the fiber orientation, again, relative to the axis of force generation. So relative to the direction that the um, the force generation is happening due to where the attachments of the muscle are. Um, so depending on the angle of the fibers relative to that axis uh, is how we will classify all of our different muscles. Okay, so longitudinal muscle architecture. In that case, we have fibers running longitudinally to the muscle's axis of force generation, meaning that the fibers are running in the same exact direction as the muscle's axis of force generation. Okay, so think like biceps brachii or triceps brachii, uh, where we have um, the two tendons on either end and the fibers running the length of the muscle in the same direction uh, where the force is applied to the bones. Um, so in these types of muscles, fibers are variable length and pass through the muscle at the widest point, which is where ACSA, anatomical cross-sectional area, is measured. Okay, so in a longitudinal type of muscle, ACSA will be about equal to PCSA, physiological cross-sectional area, uh, because although the fibers may not run the entire length of the muscle, they'll all run at least more than half so they'll all be captured if we take a cross section right in the center of the muscle. Uh, so longitudinal muscles are advantageous for a greater range of motion uh, because they have longer fibers and longer fibers allow for greater muscle excursion. 
Okay, so muscle excursion, we're referring to the total span of distance or space where that muscle can shorten to and lengthen to at its maximum. Okay, so longer fibers are able to contract to a shorter length and extend to a longer length. So that difference between the shortest and the longest is its excursion. So longer fibers have a greater amount of excursion, which allows for joints to have greater range of motion because those muscles can uh, move through a greater distance. So our longitudinal muscles are advantageous to promote better range of motion, which like we've talked about before, the body prioritizes range of motion um, above force amplification in many situations because it's important for our normal ambulation and, and movement. Um, so our longitudinal muscles are further classified as flat, strap, sphincter, fusiform, or triangular muscles that we'll talk about next. Okay, so a flat muscle is one where we have parallel fibers that culminate in flat, wide tendons. And examples would be like rhomboid major and minor and the external and internal obliques. Okay, so that's where we have parallel fibers that are going in the same direction as the um, axis of force generation, which is what makes it a longitudinal muscle. Um, but they're bigger, broader, flatter, and they end in broad, flat tendons as opposed to coming together into one narrow tendon. A strap muscle is long and thin, uh, can have an intermediate tendon like rectus abdominis does. Okay, so rectus abdominis, we have intermediate tendons that are separating this way as we go up the muscle. So the fibers are going in a superior inferior direction and then we have intermediate tendons every few inches. And that's what gives that six pack appearance um, when someone has developed rectus abdominis and doesn't have a lot of abdominal fat on top of them, you can clearly see uh, where those muscles have hypertrophy, they've gotten larger, uh, but they're still anchored by those intermediate tendons in between, which is what gives that appearance. Um, so it could have an intermediate tendon like rectus abdominis or no intermediate tendon. An example of that would be like sartorius, so long and thin and in that case, no intermediate tendon. A sphincter is a circular muscle designed to close an opening. Um, so we have countless in the body, really literally thousands, maybe millions, I don't know. Uh, we have many, many, many because uh, we have them um, in our blood vessels, we have them in our arterioles that help control our blood flow to different capillary networks and different tissues. Um, so even there, we, we would say hundreds of thousands probably, um, but then we have sphincters like throughout the digestive tract, throughout the reproductive tract. Um, so we have many different sphincters everywhere in the body. Uh, some are made of skeletal muscle, so they're voluntary and under our control, and some are smooth muscle, so they're involuntary, like some of the ones I've been describing so far. Okay, so when they're made of skeletal muscle, an example would be like orbicularis oculi. Uh, that's the muscle that surrounds the eye that it contracts to close the eye. Uh, so although we tend to think of closing your eyes as relaxing, um, actually we're contracting orbicularis oculi to cause the eye to close. Um, so it's more of a nervous system effect that it feels relaxing, but we're actually contracting a muscle to close the eyes. Okay, so other sphincters throughout the body are involuntary, made of smooth muscle. Uh, so an example of that would be like the lower esophageal sphincter um, that helps keep the contents of the stomach in the stomach and prevent it from going back up into the esophagus. So the upper esophageal sphincter at the back of the throat, that is actually voluntary. That's part of um, how we control swallowing. Okay, so that's voluntary, made of skeletal muscle. And then once the contents get to the stomach, we have an involuntary smooth muscle sphincter that helps those contents remain in the stomach. Uh, so we don't have voluntary control of whether that we have heartburn or not, essentially, of whether that acid is able to travel back up into the esophagus. Okay, a fusiform muscle has a wider belly and tapering ends like biceps brachii. Uh, 
Okay, so we've got a big belly in the middle and then the ends taper to a narrow tendon that attached to the bones. Okay, a triangular muscle is also referred to as a convergent muscle. Uh, it's a convergent fan-shaped muscle, often has a spiral or twist near one of its attachments like pectoralis major. Okay, so you can see that pec major is shaped like a big fan. Uh, where it has this big, broad attachment that spans the clavicle, the sternum, and the costal cartilage. And then they all kind of converge and twist. The muscle, the fibers kind of turn over on themselves and insert into a much smaller insertion on the humerus. Okay, pennate muscles are the ones that we talked about earlier when we were looking at ACSA versus PCSA. Um, so that's where we have shorter muscle fibers that do not go the whole length of the muscle. They're not oriented in the same direction as the axis of force generation. Here, they're at an angle relative to the axis of force generation, like what we see in this picture. So here, the, the force generation is going in the straight um, up and down direction. Um, and then we're looking at the angle of those fibers relative to that uh, y axis there. So the penation angle is the angle made between the fibers and the axis of force generation. Um, so usually it's not a very large angle. It's usually not more than 15 degrees or so, um, but there have been studies that have reported uh, as high as 25 to 30 degrees, like in soleus, um, but that's really high. That's pretty rare. It's usually closer to around 15 degrees of penation. Uh, so in a pennate muscle, the PCSA will always be greater than the ACSA. Uh, that's because there are always going to be more fibers, usually many more fibers in the muscle than what is captured in the ACSA. So when we're when we're trying to find the cross section of all of the muscles in the fi in the all of the fibers in the muscle, um, the PCSA is always going to be much greater than the ACSA if there is penation. So the greater the angle of penation, the greater the PCSA. So the more angle there is there, the more fibers that we're able to pack into that same space. So a pennate muscle has short fibers, which for one limits the muscle's excursion. So that is its big disadvantage more than anything. Um, so like with a longitudinal muscle, we have a greater excursion, so we can have greater range of motion. A pennate muscle is going to allow for less range of motion because it has less excursion. Um, but the upside and the reason we have these types of muscles is that it allows for more, many more fibers to fit within the same space that the muscle takes up. Okay, so we might take up the same amount of space but if all the fibers are going in the same direction, we'll have fewer fibers than if they're at an angle and they're much shorter. We can pack in many more fibers within the same exact space. So more fibers means more force generation, even if those fibers are shorter. So the length of the fiber is what determines our muscle excursion, but how many fibers is what determines how much force we can produce. So we'll have the same amount of mass in the muscle and we can have it take up the same amount of space. But when that mass is made up by shorter and more numerous fibers, that means we could produce a lot more force by that same muscle. So a pennate muscle will be able to produce significantly more force than a longitudinal muscle of the same exact size. Um, so the mass of the extremities tapers from proximal to distal to minimize rotational inertia. We've talked about that a couple times now. Uh, so here we are again. Um, what that means in this context is that a lot of our more distal muscles, the muscles in our distal segments, like in the forearms and the calves, are pennate because we're able to generate more force with less mass of muscle. Um, so they're more likely to be penated, uh, maximizes the muscle's force production capability, and contributes the least amount of mass to the limb as possible. So remember, the more distal on the limbs we are, the less mass the body wants to have there, uh, because if we have more mass, it makes movement a lot more difficult. Um, so we want less mass there, and we can achieve the same amount of force with less mass by having penated 
muscles. Okay, another thing here, the velocity of contraction. Uh, so velocity of shortening of a muscle fiber is proportionate to the number of sarcomeres in series. Okay, so the velocity, the how fast that muscle fiber is shortening is proportionate to how many sarcomeres in series we have, which what we're really saying is how long the fiber is. A longer fiber will have more sarcomeres in series lined up. A longer fiber has more sarcomeres in series, which need to contract faster to shorten the muscle. So what we're saying is if we're gonna have the same amount of shortening of the muscle, the longer fiber with more sarcomeres will have to shorten faster than a short fiber to achieve the same amount of excursion, to achieve, to achieve the same amount of shortening. And if you think back to our force velocity relationship, the faster the sarcomeres shorten, the less force they're able to produce. Okay, so a shorter fiber has fewer sarcomeres in series, which can contract more slowly to shorten the muscle. So what we're saying is not only does a pennated muscle have more fibers and therefore can produce more force, but because those fibers are shorter, they have fewer sarcomeres in series, they're also allowed more time to contract to cause the same amount of shortening as when we have a really long fiber. So that long fiber has to go really fast to catch up to what the short fibers could do very slowly. So the short fibers are able to produce more force because they're able to uh, shorten much more slowly. Okay, a unipennate muscle is a pennate muscle that has one long tendon that runs the length of the muscle and one set of fibers arranged at an oblique angle to the tendon. So good examples would be vastus lateralis or tibialis posterior. Both are shown in these pictures here. And so we have a long tendon that goes the whole length of the muscle and then these short pennated fibers that are coming off at an angle um, from that tendon. So it's unipennate because they're only coming off of one side of that tendon. Bipennate is exactly the same thing, but where we have two sets of fibers, so one coming off of each side of that long tendon. So we have two sets of fibers, one arranged obliquely on either side of the long tendon, and that would be like gastrocnemius or rectus femoris. Both have that design. Multipennate muscles are pennate muscles that have more than one longitudinal tendon running the length of the muscle. Um, so then we have a variable set of oblique fibers coming off of each of those tendons. So we can have multiple tendons going between the origin and the insertion, and then each of those tendons will have two sets of fibers that are coming off. A good example of that would be like deltoid, like we see in the picture here. Okay, so that is all I have for you. And I'll see you for the next video.